Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about WireGuard VPN. And by no coincidence, I'm wearing a shirt that says simplicity is genius. And I thought this was something that really applied to WireGuard, and I grabbed this shirt figured, hey, this is a good shirt to wear doing this video because WireGuard has a simplicity to it that makes it very attractive and one of the reasons it's very popular. What we're going to discuss in this video is how to set up your own WireGuard server. I have all the time indexes below if you don't want to hear me talk about some of the fundamentals of WireGuard and want to skip right to the tutorial part. And I will be discussing some of the shortcomings of WireGuard. And that's the first part that I'm going to ramble on a little bit about. And I want to make sure all the understanding of the WireGuard VPN protocol is there, especially some of the fundamentals. Before we dive into all this, let's first... If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free, and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now, back to our content. We'll start here at WireGuard.com. WireGuard is a modern, fast, secure VPN that uses modern cryptography. Pretty straightforward in terms of all the details they have and you know why you should use it. It's simple and easy to use, cryptographically sound, minimal attack surface, high performance, well-defined, thoroughly considered. And people that have followed my channel for a while may ask about formal verification. They do have formal verification on the protocols themselves. They have several white papers, several write-ups, and it's gone through quite a bit of review. But one thing I want to mention here, and we'll get into the known limitations in a second, but they have an entire white paper that breaks down exactly how it works. Lots of really good details. And I've actually spent a lot of time reading to make sure I understand every aspect of it, which is also why I want to get to known limitations and some of the challenges with WireGuard. Now, they have a whole page on this, but I'm just going to speak to it. One of the problems with WireGuard is it does not have a username or password implementation. They have left this up to third party. And this may be a problem for some people because I've been asked, well, won't this just automatically replace OpenVPN and not exactly. Those mechanisms that are well-defined and well OpenVPN, for example, has been around for a long time. And username, password, plus key authentication, multiple factors here, has been around and very popular and well thought out in OpenVPN. WireGuard just kind of left that aside and basically decided they were going to create a very basic protocol, have really solid implementation, but leave it up to third party for all the other features around it. And many firewall vendors will then come up with how they want to implement WireGuard. Now, WireGuard is a very easy replacement for something like IPsec. So if you have the option to use WireGuard and it has a full kernel space implementation in your distribution, currently Linux has a full kernel space implementation as of November 2020. The BSD one is coming for other firewalls that are ready to fully implement this in kernel space that are based on BSD. But the firewall vendors are going to have to leave it up to them if they want to integrate username and password in there. And this is going to be a challenge because this is where the attack surface comes in. WireGuard, the protocol is sound. It's just like OpenVPN. The protocol is very sound. But many vendors start doing their own thing of how they implement it. And that system they create around it for username and password is where there may be some attack surface. So even though the protocol is solid and if you were just to do a site-to-site -site VPN, you probably wouldn't have much to worry about. If each firewall vendor will have to examine how they do implementations of things like username and password because it's not part of the WireGuard protocol, it'll be their implementation of it. And I bring this up because there's also a company called Tailscale. Now, the goal in the end of this video is you're going to have a completely working VPN server to connect to and wrap all your traffic in. But we're doing this 100% manual because the goal is also to have an understanding of the fundamentals of how WireGuard works. Tailscale is, well, it's going to be a solution for the majority who go, I don't want to know the inner workings. I want a secure VPN, but I don't want to deal with setting it up. And they're just a company that I have not used. I bring them up because, well, they were just in the news for this. And I tweeted this out uh, talking about they have raised some money and people have asked me to review it. It's a paid service that just is a wrapper for WireGuard. So it's not anything I really, I mean, it might be a cool solution. It's not something I plan on deploying anytime soon or actively using. As far as I'm concerned, OpenVPN is going to be around for quite a while. A couple other limitations. 
One of them is deep packet inspection. There is nothing in WireGuard to support obfuscation. What that means is anyone doing any type of really basic deep packet inspection is going to be able to recognize the traffic as WireGuard traffic. TCP mode, same problem. OpenVPN, I'll throw out there as an example again. OpenVPN has some methods to one, switch it to TCP mode and then hide it to make it look like SSL to try to fool deep packet inspection systems. It's not like foolproof, but it's a way to hide the type of traffic. WireGuard makes nothing uh, and no attempts to hide this. And this may be a problem for some people. So it's not likely to be a protocol that's getting around, so to speak, any type of filtering. Matter of fact, it's quite easy to filter, not based on the port, but based on the definition of the traffic because any type of obfuscation will have to come from a third party and add on for WireGuard. It's not something WireGuard has any native support for. Uh, they have a few other details in here I'm not going to dive into, but they are really solid though on overall. And I will at least mention on performance, while hardware crypto is a thing that helps some of the other protocols, it's not even really needed in WireGuard, but maybe it will make it even faster in the future. As of right now, it does not have any, well, right now I should say, it doesn't really have any need for hardware crypto, which is good because it then it works on a general purpose CPU, but this is actually where potential, maybe someone will develop some type of processor that makes it even faster. So that's some future thinking stuff. But I'll leave you links to all this. Of course, it's all at WireGuard.com of some of the things we talked about. And if you want to dive even deeper than I plan to, dive into the white paper. Now we're going to go to the tutorial part and I'm going to break down how to set up a server in DigitalOcean and the accompanying forum, forum posts. So all the commands that I'll be typing, you'll be able to find uh, in the forum posts that will be linked below in the description of this video. So let's get started on building our server and getting routing set up. Now we're going to be doing this in DigitalOcean because I've had an account for a while and I've always been happy with DigitalOcean. It's where my forums and other projects I have are hosted. We do have an affiliate code down below that does help out and give us some resources to create these. And it helps out the channel if you want to use the affiliate link to sign up. Not required, but appreciated. Now choose an image. We chose Ubuntu 20.10 basic and their $5 a month plan here. Really straightforward, uh, New York option, and or choose a region you're, uh, wherever you want to come out for your VPN. I chose New York for the purposes of demo. I already have my SSH keys installed in DigitalOcean. And uh, I've got a video if you were looking for more information on how SSH keys work. Now I just check this box to say yes, load those keys, and then we give it a name. Now I've already created the project and I have actually more than one I've created. Specifically, the one we're going to be using is this YouTube WG for WireGuard demo. And the public IP address is 192.241.141.25. And no, for anyone that may not be completely familiar with how private IP space works, just because it begins at 192 doesn't mean it's private IP. Um, it's just public IP is this 165 one below it. But specifically, this is the one we're going to be using. Now we're going to go over here and walk you through what was changed on here. So this is the YouTube WG demo. And then we have the write-up that will be linked as well. This is the step-by-step -step write up. So if you see me typing commands, you don't have to grab them off the screen. There's a link below to this write up in my forums and this video is embedded within. So you, whether you started at the forums or started this video, there's links back and forth to both. Now server site setup, create the droplet, load Ubuntu 2010, update it. We've already taken care of that, but I recommend it. People ask, how do you get your command prompt to look like that? Well, I do have the dot files and how that works. So it's easy enough to go through and change those command prompt looks like that. Optional, maybe you don't want to change it, but that's something that I have linked and listed in there. The first thing we need to do is enable IP forwarding. To have this server act as a forwarding server so you can connect your computer to it and forward all the traffic so it comes out of that as a public IP address, you need to enable forwarding. So to enable it, right here, we do the edit, the etc, sysctl.cn, CONF, so syscontrol.conf in the Etsy folder. So we'll go over here, we're gonna to go to Vim, drop that in there, and right here where it says net IPv4 forward equals one. So normally, that's commented out, all I did was get rid of it. Use Vim, use Nano, use whichever you're one here comfortable with, and that's how you turn that on. So that's all we have to do is enable the forwarding. Next step, you can run syscontrol-p to activate it or reboot the server. Once you change that, it doesn't change immediately. It changes next time that's loaded, but syscontrol-p will activate the changes or, like I said, rebooting the server. apt-get install WireGuard. 
Uh, pretty straightforward there just to go after get install WireGuard. We've already got the latest one installed, so no big deal. Pretty straightforward. This is all built right into Ubuntu. This is one of the reasons I chose it. Everything's already in here. Now, this part's really important. You want to regenerate, or I should say generate private keys. If I did it again, it would regenerate them. UMass 077 WG Gen Key. Now, the way WireGuard works, WG is the server command. So it starts out WG. There's also WG Quick. It's part of the command structure that we'll be using for this. And what we have is we want to, we'll go to CDSC WireGuard, and we want to create these. So they have UMass 077, so the permissions are proper. The default UMask would create them with other permissions. That could be a problem you have, but there's the public key and there's a private key. And don't worry, this server, when I'm done with this video, will get destroyed, so it's okay that I show these public and private keys. Next step after you've created the keys is you're gonna want to cat private key. And I'll show you what that does. So if we go here to cat private key, there's the private key that we need. From there, we need to create the wg0.com file. So we'll go vim wg0.conf. Now, if it's not created Vim and typing a blank file name or nano, the file name will create the file, then we got to put these settings in. But we need to make sure we have this right here, this private key. I recommend copying it, pasting it in uh, to the configuration because you have to get that private key set up here. So here is our private key, and this is the settings for the, the WireGuard server. We're going to ignore this part for now, the peer settings. We're going to focus on the top part. Interface address, 192.168.69.1. You have to set up an internal IP address for the routing to take place. It's kind of like an intermediary. So this is an internal IP that we have. Then we need this right here. This is a very important line for masquerading to work properly in NAT. So this allows the servers that are connecting, or I should say the clients that are connecting, to route through here via essentially NAT. So they're going to be able to come through from their location, come through as NAT, assume the IP address of this particular server, and then go back out. Post up versus post down. Post up means turn on all these features when the WireGuard interface comes up. Post down means shut this interface down when you're done. You don't really need the post down, but it, I left that in here. Uh, that way it shuts everything down and turns everything off on the server whenever you stop the WireGuard interface. Listen port. I'm using the default listen port of 51820. Use whichever listen port you want, but you have to modify this tutorial, of course, everywhere that listen port comes up. And there's that private key. So when we said cat private key and dump that out, that just simply goes here. So straightforward private key. Please note there's a private key space equals space then the private key. And yes, there's an equals at the end, but don't add a space there. It's very important that the formatting is right. And I have the formatting in here exactly the same because this is all copy and pasted other than your private key goes here. So someone doesn't try to use my private keys and mess things up. They are private and public key pairs. If you were to copy some of the settings I have and put my private key, but have a different public key, you'll get problems with this system. All right. Now, that's pretty much it for the interface setup and essentially the server side setup. Peers are the systems you're going to have connecting to you. And we're going to go and look at our peer settings, which are pretty much the same. We go over here and same thing. This is a Debian server that I set up just for this. And it's behind a firewall. It's just one of my lab systems that I had conveniently located. And it's running Debian Linux Bullseye. So five and a kernel 5.9, which has the WireGuard client built in. We did the same thing, updated it, loaded WireGuard. And now we can go over here and actually we can just jump right to the edit Etsy WireGuard. And we're going to create a config over here. We're going to call it youtube.com. I just wanted to make sure there are two different names. I could have called this anything I want. We called it WG0. I don't know about anything, but within reason, you can give it different names. We're calling this one youtubevpn.conf. And I did this to try to be as clear as possible when I'm on the client side, which is this Debian machine versus the Ubuntu machine that's going to act as our server. That way there's kind of a distinction between them. So when we're in here, we have the peer as in this is its peer. So this is the server side. This is essentially the client config, the YouTube VPN. So this is where the public key is. And the public key, and we'll actually exit out of this real quick, and we can go cat slash Etsy WireGuard public key. 
there's the public key of the Debian client system that we want to connect. And you can see, we'll just look at the last couple, Z0PKW, and we see Z0PKW. So this is what allows us to have this system connect to it. So we did the same thing, generated those keys, and we got to put the public key of this server over here. And let's, before we go any further, jump into this. This is kind of a layout. So those of you that like me mapping it out in a tool, this is done in draw.io. And you can see this is the interface config for the Ubuntu WireGuard server. This is the interface config for the Debian test server. And both of these are also laid out in that forum post. So this particular box has behind a firewall. It's going to go through here, go out to the internet and connect to this. The same thing. The public key of this server is located in the config of the Ubuntu server and vice versa is true. The public key of the Ubuntu server is going to be what we put into the Debian test server. So that's all you need in terms of how WireGuard authenticates. As I said, it doesn't have a username and password. It does all of this with peered authentication with public key. So there's just a, a public key over here, a public key over here. As long as we know each other's public keys, we keep the private keys private. That's all we need to know to have these connecting. So let's go back over to our config. I'm going to go here, look at it. Now comes the endpoint. And so we have the public key over here, the endpoint. There's that 192.241, whoops, 192.241.141.25 colon 51820 for the ports. Now we have allowed IPs. Allowed IPs forward all traffic to server is what I have here. But if you were to say, We'll insert another line afterward and we need to do allowed IPs equal 192.168.69.0/24. Then whatever other networks we could then, and we'd have to comment this one out. This would allow for essentially a split tunnel type of routing. You would specify what networks and IP addresses are allowed and this means the client would connect and only route that particular traffic. But WireGuard has the option to route all traffic through. So this is where if you were doing split tunnel, you would just split it here. If you're not doing split tunnel, you want a full tunnel where all traffic, you do 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and forward all traffic to server. This is it. This is one of the beauties of WireGuard is that's all the config we need to get that working. So we'll go ahead and exit that. And then we'll go ahead and exit this. Now, one more thing that's in the tutorial here is getting this set up so it works on boot. So one of the things we have here is if you want the WG0 interface to be active on boot, you need to run system control enable WG-quick at WG0. So this command right here. Let me talk about what that does. So WireGuard, when it's up and running, and we'll actually go over here, we're on the server, the DigitalOcean server, we'll clear and we use the WG quick command to down the interface. So we went down the interface, so there's nothing in here. So if we do WG show, WireGuard show, there's no connections, there's no tunnels, there's no nothing here. So we're gonna go WG quick, we're gonna up, and we're gonna up that interface, WG zero. That's it, there's the entirety of it. And if we do WG show, the interface is just sitting here, waiting for something to happen. So it dumps out the public key right here, the listening port, all UDP. This is the peers that are allowed. So currently there's this peer right here is allowed, persistent keep alive every 25 seconds. Now I won't get too much into it, persistent keep alive. You may or may not need that depending on if the client is one behind NAT and two, whether or not you're worried about those connections going stale. What that means is if you have a client, and we'll explain this really quickly here, and you have like this Debian test client and we have it connecting to here because silence is a virtue according to the documentation of WireGuard, which means it does not make a bunch of noise to keep the tunnels alive and it doesn't really need to. So if both devices are on public IP addresses, anytime they initiate traffic, it automatically renegotiates and starts passing traffic. But the keep alive, if you want the Ubuntu WireGuard server in DigitalOcean to be able to talk to the DBN server whenever it wants to, even though it's behind a firewall, you need to occasionally send a keep alive to keep the state table alive. If not, this will go quiet over here, and then this will not be able to initiate a connection over here. 
That's if you need that. Let's say, and we'll use the phone as an example. If I'm using a phone, which is behind a firewall, and I want it to connect, well, I only want my connections initiated from the phone. So in that case, I wouldn't want to keep alive. Or if I didn't care whether or not this server could talk back to this, I don't need to keep alive because as soon as this server initiates a connection, it'll go through and create its own state table or a fresh one if the old one expired and go through there. So they have a better explainer if you look up the keep alive options inside of WireGuard that goes more in depth of different scenarios. But we'll go ahead and leave it in for purposes of this video. But it just of note, if you were using a phone, less likely you'll be using it there. So this is up and running. If we go to ifconfig, there is WG0. WireGuard just adds an interface once you bring these up. So we have our standard ETH0, ETH1, which is an internal shared, your local, and then WG0. Now let's go over here and we'll do WG quick. And you're probably thinking, I want to up the, let me share, I probably have an interface up. Nope, none of them are up. So we actually go here, WG quick up, and we'll type in YouTube VPN. Before we type that, let me show you what IF config brings up. There's ETH0, there's our local IP address, and there's the local interface. So there's only the couple interfaces, but when we do WG quick up, and we type in YouTube VPN. Then we type IF config again. We have a interface called YouTube VPN. Now this is actually kind of neat and we're, we'll play something real quick here. WG quick down YouTube VPN. And we'll go over to, let's see, WireGuard and we'll list. I have a handful of different ones in here. I have a WG one. Let's even do this. We're gonna, just gonna copy the YouTube VPN to tom.conf. Now we're not changing anything about it. We're just creating a copy. But now when we do WG quick again, up, oh, we'll call it uh, Tom. And then we go in IF config. Now there's a Tom interface. WG zero makes the most sense from a logical standpoint, like we have over here, because it's WireGuard interface zero. And yes, you can have multiple interfaces because we can even do WG quick. And then up and then we can do the YouTube one. And then we go IF config and now we have a Tom VPN and a YouTube VPN. So this is kind of a fun thing about WireGuard is you can just create creating all these different interfaces. This is also why WireGuard is not a protocol that's very big because after this, once it creates interface, all the other routing information, everything else is just standard Linux networking and routing to configure this. So now we'll go back to WG quick down and we'll take down the YouTube one. All right, and with all the interfaces brought down, we're back to just the basics. Now let's bring the interface back up so we can actually do some WireGuard commands here. So WG quick, we'll up, and we're gonna just use YouTube VPN like we have in the write up. And I want you to notice something here. There's not anything really to show. So if we look at it, latest handshake six seconds ago, and we should be able to ping now 192.168.69.1 which I can ping it and 69.1, if you didn't notice, is this IP address here. There's not anything to tell you or do anything about the interfaces like making noise. Matter of fact, without restarting this particular one, we're gonna stop this one. So we'll do WG quick and we'll do down WG zero. So we took it down, broke the connection, and now we're just gonna go ahead and WG quick, bring the connection back up. Now, normally, and once again, I'll use OpenVPN as an example, you would have to go to the client and tell it to reconnect, reestablish those connections, and there might be some type of delay. In the world of simplicity, and it's gonna take a second here because it's realizing that old state table probably broke, but it will renegotiate without any noise, without you having to reauthenticate, and just start talking again to that server. And that's it. All done in real time. I didn't edit that or make it jump ahead. That's the slow delay from this server starting it to the route and connection being reestablished. It's really fast overall when you're doing uh, things get moved around. Matter of fact, if there's any type of roaming, because we did not specify like a specific IP that this has to come from in terms of this 
Debian client. So if it were to move or it's behind a different IP address, that can happen relatively seamlessly because as soon as it negotiates, the negotiation process is extremely fast and you don't have to actively take it up and down. So we didn't have to do anything on here. It tried the old state table, it waited, it realized it was broken, it establishes a new one automatically, and now we're talking. Of course, the next question is, if we go here to view, I have config, actually, uh, we want to know the IP address. So let's, uh, I have config and we see that 69.2 is where we're routing everything over. But if we type the route, we're now pushing out everything over here. So 192.68 is now the default route, the YouTube VPN. This means all the traffic's going to be tunneled there. Now, if you're not familiar with the website, ifconfig.co, it's a really handy, and I've blurred out my information here, but this website tells you what's your IP address. It's very similar to what's my IP, but the cool thing is you can use curl to find out what your public IP address is. Now, I've blurred out my public IP address at my office here, but let's go over here, and we're going to type curl, ifconfig.co. After I spell it right, ifconfig.co, and it gives me 192.241.141. Dot two five. And if we do WG quick down the YouTube VPN, and then we go back to curl ifconfig.co, I'm blurring it out, but that's my public IP address. So that quick, we can bring it up and down. And actually, let's go WG quick and go up, actually clear. Then we're going to go curl ifconfig.co, and we're back to routing traffic all back out of our DigitalOcean VPN. It very quickly brings these services up and down. There's not much delay, especially when you already have the server running. I can take this down, bring it back up. There's not a long negotiation process where it goes through to get connected and routing again. Now, the next thing I wanna do, and we're gonna leave this Debian client up and running, and it has the IP address of 192.168. 69.2 internally, and we're going to leave it up and running while we connect another system. And working in Linux is pretty easy for me, but I know a lot of people are going to be using Windows, so I have a Windows client that I'll show how to do this as well. And the nice thing is there's already a WireGuard client for Windows. Pretty straightforward. We go here to WireGuard wireguard.com slash install. I downloaded the Windows installer, and then we ran through the installer really just a couple next and yes, and now we have to build our tunnel. So we're gonna go here and we're gonna add an empty tunnel and call it YouTube demo. So we can call it whatever we want. YouTube demo sounds good to me. And we have here the public key. Don't worry about the private key. Once again, I'm gonna be destroying all these when I'm done with this video, but we need to get the public key over to the other server. So here's that public key, and let's get the server settings set up. So we're going to switch back over. And this is our YouTube WG demo server, and we're going to go ahead and take down the uh, VPN. So we'll go WG down, WG0, BIM, such the WireGuard WG0. And now we have to add another peer. So here's that test Debian client peer, public, allowed, persistent, keep alive. And then we're going to create another peer over here. And we call this peer Windows client. Here's the public key. There's the allowed IPs, 69.3, because we're going to increment uply. Now, as I stated before, there's not any type of DHCP system or any IP addressing system inside of WireGuard natively. You can rely on external services for it. In this case, because we're manually creating the files, we're just going to increment to the next IP address. But you can set these however you want, as long as they're within the address range here, which is 192.168.69.1 slash 24, giving it a slash 24 range. So we'll go to dot three here. There's that public key, and there's the IP address that we want. Go back over to here. There's that same public key that we copied over there. And now we got to put some settings inside of here. And we got to put the peering settings in. And it's the same as it was on our Linux system. There's the public key. That public key is related to the public key of Ubuntu server. And we put that public key, allowed IPs, endpoint 192.168.141.25. And the same thing, colon. 51280. One more thing we have to add up here is we got to assign the IP address. So we're going to say address equals 
168.69.3 slash 24. And away we go. So here we go. Hit save. Block untunneled traffic kill switch. I like that they built this right in. That means once we wrap this system, it is going to lock in all the traffic and send it out over through that tunnel. So if you're looking for the whole VPN solution, this is the way to implement it. So we're going to hit save, but we're not going to activate it just yet. And the reason why is because, well, we didn't save this yet. So we're going to go ahead and uh, save this. And then we do WG quick up WG zero. All right, so now this is turned up and running. Go back over here, go to our wire guard, and we're gonna hit activate. Simple as that, it's activated. Now we should be able to go to what's my IP. And that didn't work, meaning we did something wrong. So let's troubleshoot this real quick and figure out which command Tom copied and pasted wrong. I found it, I mistaped the public key right here because I copied and pasted the wrong one. So this public key, we'll go back over here did not match inside of here. So we're gonna go here and vim wireguard conf, delete this public key and replace it with the right one. So I figured I'd leave this mistake in the video instead of editing it out. So there we go, there's the public key. Now we can do WG quick down, whoops, down WG zero. And we'll do a quick up, WG zero. Oh, and for those wondering, yes, we could do a system control and restart it as well. I just started using WG quick and starting familiarizing myself with the WireGuard commands. But now this should bring the tunnel back up and running. We'll go back over to our windows with the correct one in now and toggle the tunnel. So we'll hit save. Activate. We'll do a ping test real quick. Feel weird using... Oh, look, it's working. Feel weird sometimes using Windows. I've used Linux so much. Sorry about the little typos there. Now let's do a what's my IP. And we see the 192. And of course, we, I prefer to go to uh, ifconfig.co, which failed this time for a different reason. Um, the DNS isn't set. I have it blocked a tunnel and I had it forced to be a local IP, local DNS address, which we can fix pretty quickly. We're going to go change the network settings for that. And you can specify DNS settings right inside of here. I'm just choosing to use Cloudflare's DNS to make it simple, but you can specify another DNS server or even other local servers, etc. however uh, you want to specify them. But we'll go ahead here and hit activate now. Make sure DNS is working. Hey, look, it's resolving. And that means I have config.co should work now. And it does. And the IP address is the same as our DigitalOcean server. So I left all these little mistakes in here because these are some of those troubleshooting things you'll find. And of course, go through the documentation. I encourage you to do that if you want to know all the extra features that are available inside of WireGuard. Of note, so this IP address is 192.168.69.3. And if you remember, our Debian Linux client was 69.2. So if we go over, back over to that, make sure the tunnel's still up and running. Yes, it's still getting the right IP address. We'll go back over to Windows. Let me go over here and we're going to do a ping. Dot two. And now I'm actually pinging all the way out to the WireGuard server, round trip and coming back. So I'm able to talk to the servers on there. This is one of the natures of the way the default settings are, is all the clients that attached to this same interface that are all in that same 192.168.69 subnet. There's no rules written between them. Now you could write rules between them, not necessarily in WireGuard, but with other firewall utilities uh, that are built into Linux. But by default, just so you know, if you build this out, all of the clients that you connect also will be able to talk to each other. That may be a feature you want, that may be a feature you don't want. One of the ways to easily get around this is we can build multiple tunnels on the WireGuard server. So we can build like a tunnel for one group and another group and another group. That way those groups don't necessarily talk to each other or you can go out and build rules between them. Now, hopefully this is helpful for setting up your WireGuard server. I know it's a lot to go through. There's a lot of documentation, but I wanted to do this video to talk about the raw settings of WireGuard. Having these fundamentals to me really helps understand 
when you start using it inside of a firewall or inside of another deployment or integrated with something else. Like I said, there's popular tools out there, Tailscale being one of them that I mentioned at the beginning, that offer basically an interface to put on top of this. As the WireGuard protocol becomes more popular and we see more VPN companies implementing it, each one of them will do their own thing on top of it. But whenever you want to get deep into network troubleshooting, I always find it helpful to understand the fundamentals of how these things work. And that's what I wanted to cover in this video. So of course, I'll leave a link to the forum post. Uh, feel free to comment down there, but this should be enough to get you started and start playing with it and gain better understanding understanding of it. Also, because everything is run from the command line with this with WireGuard, you'll probably find if you spend some time on GitHub, a lot of automatic deployment utilities. And of course, you can think of ways to automatically deploy this yourself. By being able to script all these installs and all the functionality of it, it's actually a pretty very much powerful system uh, to get up and running for you know tying scenes together, even if they're behind firewalls. Hopefully this was helpful and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.